This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, delighted to see Annie, Mandy, Kathy, Stephanie, Rochelle, and Kevin on the call today. Uh, undoubtedly, we'll be joined by a few more, but I appreciate y'all jumping uh, right in real quickly. Um, I'm going to talk to you with you today um, about negotiations. Um, I'm excited to share a few thoughts with you, um, but before we get there, let's just pause real quick and say, uh, hey, what's going on in your world, good, bad, or otherwise? We'll deal with questions and problems and situations later, but but uh, tell us some big wins uh, that you've had or uh, just incremental progress that you've experienced. What's going on in your business? So um, I, um, I'll start the, today. Okay, Rochelle, no, go ahead. So I have a potential um, client that's relocating from Chicago and they only want to look at new builds in the area. Does anybody have like a listing of new builds and they want to be around around 400? You do, Kevin? Okay. So what have you got, Kevin? I got, I got the deets. I got the details and I can direct you towards that. Um, does anybody else have an interest in that? And, and if so, I'll, I'll throw it on the chat if I can find it. If not, I'll get it to Rochelle after. Where are we? I don't see any okay. other. I'll get it to you after, Rochelle. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So, Rochelle, since you brought it up, I have to ask the question. You know what it's coming. You could say it for me. How did you get this new client? Fear of influence. Okay, there we go. We, we could have taken a vote, right? Uh, congratulations. How do you know this person? Or is it a referral from somebody that you know? Um, it's a friend of mine. Um, when we were in Chicago, our kids went to the same daycare. Okay, very so good. So her husband is retiring and they're looking to move here um, early part of next year. Her husband is a tyrant? No, he's Did retiring. He's retired. Okay, that's better. I'm, I didn't think <laughs> I heard tyrant, but I'm like, that can't be true. So he's actually okay, a nice awesome. guy, but he's retiring. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Stephanie, did you want to get on in on this one? I thought you had uh, unmu unmuted yourself. I, I was trying to get my camera to work. Mine on this side is not working. I, is it on that side? No, we, we saw you okay. at first, but you have gone blank on us now. It has disappeared on me over here. Anyway, um, so I'm still just recovering, I feel like, from everything that went on last year. Um, I've got a couple of listings. I have been reaching out to home builders to see if they'd be interested in picking up one of my listings because it's large. It's 110 acres and it's out in the rural area of Tarkington. And I'd noticed that there was a new community going out in Tarkington on, on Highway 321. So I'd reached out to the same builder and said, hey, would you be interested in putting in another neighborhood around the corner from you? Uh, and so I've been in contact with them, uh, but I've also emailed several other uh, developers to see if I okay. can get uh, so much. So it's, it's a different tactic completely. It's like, yes, you know, um, I know that someone could buy this and maybe turn it into a farm or buy this and use commercial property or buy this and, you know, fill in the blank. Um, but for this particular buyer, he or the seller, he has been through two other agents and, he fired both of them because he said um, they just they just put it on the market and they did nothing else. And I want to be uh, that agent that does more. OK, so, Stephanie, um, quick question for you about the property. 110 acres. Does it mm -hmm. have utilities to the property? It has utilities to the property, but it, it would need a utility district. Okay. So if you want to send me a link to that listing, I may have a guy um, who'd be interested in it as well. He actually is a consultant to two builders. And that's one oh, of the good. things that he does is, is find property for them. And apparently he's working with one who's got unlimited funds to spend and they just having trouble finding, finding the appropriate okay. property. That would be lovely. I will send this listing to you. Yeah, Stephanie, yes. the, the same if you 
if you drop it to me, I've got a, a developer friend who um, um, I'll put it to him. And you say the town is Parkinson, Texas? Parkington. Parkington. With a T. Okay. Parkington. Got it. Yeah. So thank you. Since we're sharing properties, I've got yes. one that yeah. I'm I'm looking for. And I I I honestly cannot remember how I got in touch with this person. I've never met them in person, but I've been trying to help them for a few weeks. Uh, she is representing a synagogue in the woodlands. They are looking for a property to hold their Friday night, Saturday morning services. They would like to purchase. They've got $800,000 ready to go. They could go up to a million and they only need a couple thousand square feet. And in that, in that space, large enough to hold a meeting for 30 to 35 people. So it could be um, residential in a, in an area that doesn't prevent a religious meeting. Um, it could be a commercial location. It could be an office. It could be a, a barn, uh, could be really anything. They want to be in the woodlands area. Um, you know, they could go on the, on the east side of 45 into Oak Ridge or up to Conroe, but, but generally in this area. So it just, if you can just help me think creatively about any kind of building, that could accommodate a group of 30 to 35 people under a million dollars, um, you know, within say 10 miles of our spring campus, uh, please let me know, drop something in the chat or call me afterwards. That'd be awesome. I really want to help them They're They've been looking for over a year and uh, like uh, Stephanie's situation, they've gone through a couple of realtors who just really uh, were not motivated to help them. So I'm, I'm trying to find something for them. So, all right. Uh, looks like we've been joined by Tom and Velvet and Belinda and Nancy and Annie. That's fantastic. Good to have all you guys here. Let me go ahead and grab back the microphone and uh, talk with you for just a few minutes about something that I'm passionate about. And today it's going to be negotiations. Now, how often are we involved in negotiations, by the way? <laughs> Kevin just answers yes. <laughs> All the time. We, All the time. <laughs> All the time. There we go. That's the right answer. So we Especially we tend children. to think of negotiations <laughs> as something combined to when we're representing a buyer or seller and trying to negotiate a deal, or when we ourselves go to buy a car every five or six years, and you know we brace ourselves for the big contest. But you're all correct. We're negotiating all the time. Um, you know, my wife and I last night, normally we do date night on Tuesdays. But we had some conflicts this week, so we had to go out last night. It's always a negotiation. Where are we going to go? We, you know, what, where are we going to go for dinner? And it's not like we're both arguing for our own side. Usually we're trying to, I'm trying to, she's trying to figure out what I want and I'm trying to figure out what she wants. And it's a dance to kind of <laughs> determine that everything we do essentially is a negotiation, but I want to talk very specifically about real estate negotiations, um, about the profession that we're in and how we can best represent our clients. And in the past, when I've addressed this subject, I've more so done it from a mindset perspective that, uh, you know, we want to win the, the, um, the goodwill of the agent on the other side, conduct ourselves professionally. Even if we have to say no or deliver bad news, we always put some sugar with it. We have a big smile when we're uh, asserting an aggressive position, that kind of thing. But I want to kind of go behind that uh, this morning for just a few minutes and talk about the most important factor in negotiation, that we have to understand this if we're going to represent our client to the highest level. and and stand the best chance of getting them what they want or as much as can be obtained of what they want. And that issue is power. Power. Power is the dominant factor in determining success in negotiations. And if that seems like a nebulous concept, like what do you mean power? Who's stronger? Who's got more money? No, here's what I mean. Whoever wants the deal the least, whoever needs the deal the least has the power, right? Whoever can walk away and say, ah, no big deal, 
they've got the power. The person who says, oh, man, I, I, I got to have this house. It's my dream house. It's the only one. It's the only one I can afford. I've got to have something under contract in the next three days. You know, that's the person who has the least power. Or if it's a seller saying, hey, my home's going to be foreclosed on next week. I got to I got to get I got to make a deal. You know, I wanted 350 for my house at this point. I'd take 225. Right. Because the bank's going to take it and get all of it anyway if I don't sell it now. So whoever can walk away. Whoever needs it the least has the power in the negotiation. So what that typically means is. They have options. So, for example, I got a text from an agent yesterday and she said, I put a listing on the market. We immediately got a full price, strong offer. But the buyer said they do not want to get in a multiple offer situation. That's why they made a full price offer. They want us to take it or leave it and they want our answer now. Okay, makes sense. You've heard things like this before. Um, in some markets that might fly. But by the time our listing agent had the opportunity to talk to the seller about the offer, they had already gotten 14 scheduled showings on the property and three other offers from people who had not seen the home yet. They were making offers before their scheduled appointment, and one of them was stronger than the full price offer that they had in hand. So, by the way, who has power in this situation now? Seller. Buyer or seller? Clearly the seller, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, that's what I was, because the agent was saying, well, you know, what should we do? What should we do? And, and I said, well, uh, you're, you got to represent the best interest of your seller. Now, you, you don't want to necessarily take at face value what the original buyer said you know take it or leave it we're out of here and i said you you need to at least give them an opportunity go back and say well we are already in a multiple offer situation or we're not going to take your offer we already have a better one but are you in or out the seller is the one with options therefore the seller has the power okay that's just a general concept that, that i want you to understand so how do you represent your client when you are in a position of power? That's the first question I, I want to ask. So in this case, let's just use, let's continue the same example. The listing agent is representing the seller who's got the power, 14 scheduled showings, three offers already. How do they communicate back to that original buyer's agent? And I would just make a few comments here. First of all, be clear, be firm, and set a deadline. This, these are just general principles when you're in a position of power. So it'd be following back up to that buyer's agent and say, you know, look, we appreciate very much the fact that you made a full price offer at 475. Thank you so much. The seller is, you know, very appreciative of the strength of your offer. However, I have to let you know, we've already got 14 other scheduled showings, three offers in hand one of them better than the offer that your client contributed i know you said that you you don't want to be in a multiple offer situation the buyer doesn't but there's still a chance that, that your buyer could get this home you know um i, I can't share actual numbers but I, I would encourage you go back and talk to your buyer there's they could still if this clearly the home is your first choice they made an offer on it a full price offer see if they have any wiggle room to go a little bit better because if they can there's still a reasonable chance that they're going to get this home okay uh, but but by the way because we already have these offers in hand my seller has said that they're going to make a decision at 5 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday. That's 48 hours from now. So please talk to your buyer. And if you can do anything better, let us know within the next 48 hours. OK. And, and oh, by the way, if you do choose to submit, we're going to need it in writing uh, because we have the other offers in writing as well. So we can't take a verbal. But if they're willing to to um, to uh, go higher, just send us a, a revised offer and we'll give it every consideration. So be clear. Be firm, set a deadline. But I also want to caution you, be careful when you're in a position of power because you think you have options 
sometimes those options are not all that they appear to be. Okay, so for example, let's again, let's just stay with the one we, we got on the hand. I've got, well, we've got three other offers already and one's even better. Well, look at them very carefully. That first offer might have been cash and the better offer that you have in hand is a financed offer. Uh, and it's an FHA financed offer. So if the, if the home doesn't appraise for the sale price, <laughs> there's gonna be another negotiation. So look at your options very carefully. Yes, you you could, say goodbye to the first offer because you've got so much other interest. But what if it turns out of, of all these 14 showings, nobody else makes a great offer. And then you find out that the, the one that you thought was so good, well, they've already busted out of two or three other contracts. This is a buyer who has a habit of changing their mind. Um, and you do you really want that for your seller? So when you think you're in a position of power because you have options, pause, take a deep breath and examine those options carefully just to make sure you, you don't want to presume on the unknown. Verify as much as possible to assure that you really know what those options are. Now, how do you conduct yourself if you're on the other side? say that you're the, the buyer's agent in this scenario, when you are assisting a client who does not have the power, okay? You're one of uh, offer of, of many uh, in a multiple offer situation, or you're representing a seller who is desperate to sell. They have to sell, they're under time pressure or financial pressure, so they are in the lesser position of power. How can you negotiate the best deal for your client in those situations? Now, I'm going to share a few thoughts and then I'd love to hear yours as well. But the first thing I want to say is in these situations, particularly in a home purchase negotiation, don't hesitate to appeal to the personal sympathies of the other party. Right? Because a home is an emotional purchase and it's an emotional sale. It's not like a commercial transaction where it's just a, you know, it's all about the numbers. There is emotion here. There are sellers who will accept less money from a buyer that they want to live in their house. And, and, and sometimes it's just what, well, I raised my kids here. And if I, if I accept the best offer, that's from an investor, they're gonna turn it into a rental but I can accept this lower offer. They're gonna raise their kids in this home just like we raised our kids in the home and I'm gonna have a warm, fuzzy feeling every time I think about this house in the future. So don't hesitate to appeal to personal motives. I always caution listing agents not to accept these letters from, from the buyers because they can create some exposure for the seller of, uh, of discrimination, you know, fair housing complaints. If uh, uh, any protected class information is revealed in those letters, it creates exposure for the seller. But there's very little risk on the buyer side. So if you're if you're in a position of weakness and you're trying to appeal, you know, to the seller's um, emotional side, to their feelings, find out as much about them as you can. Um, you know, did, did one of the 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 adults work at Exxon and, and, and your, your parents worked at Exxon, you know, did they grow up in Chile and you grew up in Venezuela, you got a South American, whatever it is, do what you can to establish common bonds in that letter because there's really no fair housing um, uh, issues on the part of the buyer, okay? So appeal to personal sympathies. Um, secondly, I would say be persistent. Don't give up. And this is particularly true. If you're in a multiple offer situation, it's hard to, to, to utilize this strategy. But if it's just one-on-one -on -one negotiations and you're in a weak position and they've rejected your offer, don't, don't necessarily walk away. Keep coming back. You know, present the same offer the next day. Call them back and say, hey, have you gotten any better offers? Because my buyer still really wants this home. They have given you the absolute best that they have. Is there any chance that your seller will take another look at their offer? Or you can even, if they really are at the top of their offer, you can um, sweeten the pot in some non-financial ways. Say, well, would it be helpful to your sellers if, you know, we let them stay in the home for a couple weeks? you know, giving them time to move out without any stress. 
are there things that you can do for them other than financial that would make your offer more attractive? Um, and then I would just say through the whole thing as the buy, as the, the, the weak party's representative, stay positive and friendly. Try to make the other real estate agent your ally in getting this done. And you can very uh, openly remind them that, hey, you know, we neither one of us is going to get paid unless we get to the finish line. And I, I realize this offers not everything that, you know, your, your seller or your buyer were looking for, but it, it's the best one you've gotten. It's the best one on the table and we are ready to go. We're pre-approved. We're a cash buyer. You know, we're highly motivated. You can choose the title company. You know, again, that's a great, that's a great non-financial gimme. Why don't you choose the title company? Let's go to your preferred. So in a position of weakness, try to appeal to personal motives of either the, the principal of the transaction or the agent. Now, there's last thing I want to share with you. Um, that is the question. How can you increase your power or the power of your client in a negotiation? Particularly, particularly if you find yourself in a position of weakness, how can you get stronger so that you can better advocate for them? And, and I'll open it up here. Let's, uh, let's just hear from you. How can you grow your strength in a negotiating situation? All right, Kevin, what do you think? You know, th this is a great topic and I, I would challenge everybody, think back of your last couple negotiations and how what Frank is saying here is, is totally true. Probably my last negotiation, um, selling my daughter's car and, um, I met with a, somebody who wants to buy the car last night and we did the test drive and uh, everything Frank's saying is just spot on with regard to this transaction. But the answer to the question here is how do you increase your power is by increasing your options. This is the same advice I've done for so many years in the jobs ministry. When you counsel someone, oh, they get a great offer or they think they had a good interview with Exxon and we tell them, go to Shell, go to Chevron. And then the next time Exxon calls you for the second interview, you know, you tell them, well, I, I've got an interview at noon today with Shell. I'll meet with you later. And you're not fibbing when you say that. By developing yes. additional options and in the case of our client, uh, lining up other things so they really can choose the better, uh, developing options is the short answer for me. Yes. Yeah. Actually, that is the answer that I came up with because it's options that gives you power. And you gave a perfect example of that in a job search situation. In your in the car sale situation that you described there, the buyer could increase power with negotiations with you. Say, well, you know, we just came from looking at another car that we really, really liked. Oh, and we've got an appointment right after this to go look at another one. So I'll, I did that for them. I did that for them, Frank. I told them you could buy this exact car down at CarMax for $6,000 more here. Let me give you their number. Um, <clears throat> I helped yes. him with that. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. So that's super strong on your part because you're confident that yours is the best option. Yes. Okay. Terrific. So increasing options. Let's look at it from a buyer perspective. Your buyer's in a weak position because they're not able to give the seller everything they want um, in this scenario, how could you increase the power of your buyer? How could they get additional options? You, you, you want to create the fear of loss from the seller. So you go back to the listing agent and you say, look, I realize our, our current offer wasn't everything that the seller wanted. However, um, the, I'm taking the buyer out tomorrow. And we're going to start looking at other properties. In fact, I've found three that I think are going to be a really good match right in their price range. So if your seller is at all interested in this offer, we really need to get this wrapped up tonight. Yeah, the options creates fear of loss for the other party. And it may be that the seller's not going to budge. But when they hear that, I can't just put this offer on the shelf. It's always going to be there. I can grab it at any time. No, it's about to go off the table. 
then you have increased the power of your buyer. Make sense? Okay, options. That's the key to increasing power. All right, that's what I wanted to share with you. I would love to hear from you about um, some of your experiences and lessons learned in negotiating, much like Kevin just shared with us. Um, anybody else been in a recent negotiation or one that made a big memory for you? All right, well, I'll share one more. This was not in a real estate negotiation. It was in a personal negotiation. I went through, it was earlier this week. It was just like, like two or three days ago. And uh, the other party wanted something from me. I didn't feel like I could uh, provide it to them. Um, in fact, if uh, going into the negotiation, I would have said I could never give them what they wanted. I did not have it to give. Um, but they were, they really handled themselves beautifully. And uh, we negotiated, it was a hardcore negotiation for about an hour. And um, neither one of us would have believed we could have come to a place of agreement because I kind of had my bottom line and this person had their bottom line and they really weren't, there was no real common ground in the middle. But, and there was at one point I thought, well, we're done. In the, in, the, in the negotiations, but here's what kept it going. We both had respect for each other. We, we knew nobody was playing games. Both of us were being very honest. We just didn't feel like we had a, a place of commonality to meet in the middle, um, but we hung in there. Neither one of us walked away from the table. When we just kind of hit an impasse, well, we might talk about our kids for a minute. Okay, and then come back to it, kind of just take a pause and come back. And then we'd talk a little longer and I, I'd throw out, well, you know, maybe maybe here's an alternative. You know, maybe this is something that we could do. And the other party say, he, he, you know, he did not like that, didn't didn't go anywhere. So we kind of pause and maybe talk about, you know, the Texans for a few minutes or whatever it is. Then we would come back and try again. And literally after. I thought we were really done and this was not going to happen at the very end. I said, you know what? I'm just spitballing here for a minute. I'm really just thinking out loud. I'm not making an offer. I'm not proposing a solution, but, but let me, if I can just let me process this out loud in front of you. And I outlined a scenario and he said, that'll work. He said, I'll take that. Well, then I had to ask myself, can I really give that? Right. Because I, I wasn't really making an offer. But then I thought, you know what? It's better than the alternative. The, accepting this deal is better than no deal at all. But the key to that whole thing was just the willingness to hang in there and keep talking. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tell you, I'll give one more quick example, because this was probably the boy, you talk about the most powerful example in front of my eyes. I got a, a traffic ticket one time and I, I went to court over it because I felt like it was a bogus ticket. And as I'm sitting there in the courtroom, I'm watching another attorney and his client who's a drunk driver who's had multiple convictions for drunk driving. And the judge was ready to throw the book at the guy. And, um, and the attorney would not take no for an answer. He just, and, and I, I was embarrassed for the attorney. Because he should have just walked away. The judge said no. He, in fact, the judge said, do you realize the papers are crucifying me because I've been letting off so many drunk drivers? And now you're asking me to do the very thing that, that I'm being attacked about publicly in the newspapers? And the attorney would not respond directly, but he would just say, so, uh, so judge, I just want you to know that my client here is a working man. You know, he, he, he goes to work every day. He contributes to society. He pays his taxes. And then the judge would go on a rant about there's no way I'm letting your client off. And then and the attorney would say, and, and you know, he's got three kids at home and uh, he's, he's the, the sole, you know, financial uh, provider for that family. And the judge would go off again on a rant and the attorney would come back and say, you know, something again, just something personal about, about this guy, you know, judge, he's very contrite, you know, in fact, he's joined AA, uh, he's resolved that, you know, this is never going to happen again in his life. And I could not believe it. The judge let him off. 
But it was the same thing that I experienced a couple of days ago when it seemed impossible. The, 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 the willingness of, of, the, of the attorney not to take no for an answer, not to directly confront, but just to deflect and to hang in there, to persevere. And, and it won the day. Okay, Kevin, go ahead. I am not the best at quoting scripture, chapter and verse, but, but clearly a fantastic story comes to mind where we learn that, that this judge, you know, even though he's not the best judge, he will rule for the widow because of her persistence, because she That's is right. constantly coming at him and, and this sense of persistence. And he says, enough, I'll, I'll satisfy you with justice because of your persistence. So yes. that is, um, that is there. You know, the, the other question that, that you said in yours, Frank, is uh, maybe one way to phrase it is to basically propose a hypothetical to the other party and say, yes, would, would it help if I blank? So you haven't yes. actually committed to the blank, but you know, like you said, I'm just thinking out loud, would it help if I bada bing, bada boom, uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, if, if they say they're concerned about the timing, and and then when when you get the response, sometimes it clarifies what their real issues is. They'll come back and they'll say, you know, it's really not the timing of the deal. I just told the wife we were going to get over X or something. And then you say, well, yes. maybe we could. But but that phrase would it help if I could? And yes. the hypothetical. Um, and it um, it's uh, it allows you to both speak off the record, even though you're in the yes. middle of a negotiation with each other, but you feel like, well, yeah, that would help. And bada bing. So there you go. So let me share another specific example in real estate negotiations. When you're at an impasse, consider something that you could do for the other party outside the transaction that might sway them to accept your offer. And I'll give you an example of this. I was in an arm wrestling match with another agent over the choice of the title company, right? That is a matter of negotiation. I represented the buyer, so we made the offer. As the listing agent, he had put in his listing instructions back when it was legal to do this, that you had to use a certain title company. Well, I knew I didn't have to use a certain title company, and I was drafting the offer, so I wrote my preferred title company uh, in the offer. Well, he called me back very nice, very professional, but very insistent that this deal was dead if I did not use his title company. Well, I don't like to be bullied, even by somebody with a smile. And um, and so I just very politely and professionally persisted. Well, you know, uh, I'll call him Tony. That wasn't his real name because you probably know his real name. Um, I, said, I said, Tony, um, you know, uh, I appreciate you advocating for your title company, but I'm the one writing the offer. This is always a matter of negotiation. The listing agent doesn't have a right to require, but you are required to submit all offers to your clients. So I'm submitting this offer to your client. And if they want to decline it over the choice of a title company, well, that's their choice, not yours. So you see the discussion we're having. He's being very strong. I'm, I'm being very strong, both of us polite, but both of us advocating for what we believe are our client's best interests. And then he won me over with this comment. He said, Frank, I'll tell you what, if you'll do this for me, then any time I make an offer on one of your listings or any Abbey team agent, any time I make an offer on, an, on a, a listing by your brokerage, I'll let that you or your listing agent choose the title company. And I thought, wow, we got a lot of opportunities for that. Okay, I took it. Obviously, I wanted to make the deal and I want to preserve a relationship. You never want to make too big of a deal over title company, but I also didn't want to be bullied. So I kind of hung in there and we, we wrestled back and forth. But when he made that, I thought, you know, that's a very reasonable offer. Okay you win. We'll do it your way, knowing that it'll come back the other way and you've already committed that I'll choose next time. Does that make sense? So I'll look for ways outside of this specific transaction that you might be able to offer something. So so there's another another example in the in the real estate situation. Say 
you are negotiating on behalf of a buyer for a new construction and the builders hanging tough on their price or not granting you concessions that you want, the, the upgrades or whatever, you could say something like this. You know what? I really love the community that you're building in. And I've got some buyers coming in from Chicago next week. And your, your neighborhood could be a really good fit for them. You know, as, you know, presuming that we can come to an agreement on this transaction, I'll be glad to schedule a showing appointment with you right now for those buyers. Well, huh, I mean, that's, that's going to be really hard for the builder to resist. Or you could say something like, well, you know, I'm involved in a mastermind group with other agents at my office, and I would love to bring a group of them out to your neighborhood and let you show off your inventory and your model homes to us. Um, would that be helpful to you? Well, of course it's helpful to them. Okay, well, good. Well, let's get this deal wrapped up first and then let me work on that. So think of ways you can provide value outside the transaction that will give them the logical justification for making a deal with you now. Okay. All right, Stephanie, did you want to jump in on this conversation? Um, the only thing that I wanted to say is I actually just received uh, an offer on a property and my listing is for 212000 and the offer came in at 170. And of course, that being so, so low, my client was like, nope, um, she re she uh, re submitted a counter offer. But this other agent that brought this offer, I know her and I have known her for like 11 years. Mm -hmm. So instead of when she replied back after I submitted our counter, um, she had said they're going to move on and i requested that she go back to them and take another look at the contract i said i'm going to provide you some other information that might help it might not help um yes. because my client my client had an inspection report so we went ahead and submitted that to them and a pest inspection report and uh, a list of things that she had had done following that inspection. Yes. Um, and just, I'm trying desperately to keep it alive. Yes. No, you, you did exactly the right thing, Stephanie. Add something different to the equation. And mm -hmm. in this case, you added additional documentation justifying your seller's price. You could also right. provide them with comps. Um, you could provide them with a list of upgrades that the um, seller has made to the home that may not have been adequately valued by the buyer. So again, try to change the dynamics of the equation. They think right now it's, you know, two plus two equals four, but show them that no, this, this could actually, actually equal five if you factor in this additional information. So that's a, that's a great way to keep people in the game. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to jump in? general topic of negotiations. Are you involved in one now? Getting stuck. Yes, go ahead, Kevin. Or, oh, okay. Actually, Velvet, you've got your mic unmuted first. Jump in there. Um, yeah, well, Stephanie reminded me of a negotiation I had that taught me about uh, my risk tolerance because uh, I had a, a negotiation where we, I represented the buyer and we came in really low um, and it really offended the listing agent and I, it took me some by surprise how offended she was over the offer. Um, and so it forced me to just think about what went on here. And I realized my, I'm a very, I have a high risk personally as an agent, but then my clients also were, had high risk. They didn't have to have the property. They liked it, but they were willing and okay to right. move on. Um, so I think, it was helpful for me to go, okay, Velvet, you just need to know as you're representing your clients, I had never thought about it, that I am completely fine going low if my, my clients are. So now I, I kind of ask them when they ask me, what should we offer? Well, we can be, you know, high risk and try to get the best price. But if you really love this, we need to, you know, yes. make something closer to the asking price. Yes. Yeah. So, so Velvet, what you encountered is 
the value of the property to your buyer. And that could be entirely different than the value of that property to the general public or to another buyer. So it's completely justified to come in with a lowball offer if that's all it's worth to your buyer. Or if you feel like you're going to be able to get a better price by hitting them with lowball. That often backfires, as it did in your situation, if it offends the listing agent or offends the seller. If they know this home is going to sell for 300 and you come in at 225, you may be dead in the water. I've been the listing agent in those situations and I've been instructed by my seller, don't even reply. You know, they're we not required so to. Close. Yeah. We were so close to getting it and in the last minute somebody else outbid us, but anyway. Ah. <laughs> but here's here's some advice I would give to you guys. This is to everybody. When you're presenting a low ball offer, and by low ball, I don't mean necessarily low in regard to the listing price, because sometimes listing prices can be unreasonable. But I mean low in regard to actual market value, what your comps have shown that home is likely to sell for. And if your buyer is insisting on offering significantly less than market, then when you submit that offer, um, I would acknowledge that to the listing agent and that will minimize the risk of offense and you can say hey i know the listing price is is 280 my comps have shown that it's probably going to sell in the 275 to 280 range however due to circumstances particular to my buyer they're only in a position to pay 245 Okay, maybe a little bit of wiggle room, but not much over that. 245 is really where they're at. I don't want you to be insulted or the seller. It's just they're, they really want this home and this is really all they can do. So would you present it you know, to the seller with that understanding that we're not trying to offend them? We're not calling their baby ugly. It's a beautiful home. You know, It's probably worth everything you're asking for it, but this is all we can do. I bought a car like that one time. You know, they kept they kept telling me, you know, we got to have this. We got to have this. And I would say to them, you know what? I understand that. I think it's worth every penny you're asking for it. I'm just telling you, this is all I can pay. This is this is all I can afford. Well, we'll finance it for you. No, I'm sorry. I, I don't I don't finance cars. I, I always pay cash. That's the only thing I'm, I'm comfortable doing. And and this is all I have. I'm giving you everything I have. If it's not enough for you, I understand. You know, my apologies. I don't want to offend you. Well, guess what? I bought the car for exactly what I wanted uh, because I just just very politely, persistently uh, held my ground, acknowledging the value <laughs> that they had placed on it for saying this is all I got. And, and it worked. It won't always work, but it did in that case. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to wrap things today by sharing a few uh, negotiating resources with you. These are just a few of the books that are on my shelf. In regard to negotiations, you can negotiate anything by uh, Herb Cohen. Uh, short little book, but really good. You can negotiate anything. Uh, probably the most popular of the books I'm going to share with you, Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without uh, Giving In. There's a big emphasis in this uh, book on achieving win-win negotiating outcomes which is one of my core beliefs. We, we want everybody being happy with the deal at the end. It's not a win-lose situation. We're not trying to be sharks and bullies, even though we're aggressively advocating for our client's position. We want the other side to feel as they walk away that they got what they wanted out of the transaction. And then uh, the only negotiating guide you'll ever need, 101 ways to win every time in any situation. All of these books take slightly different approaches. Um, and now I'm going to share with you my, my favorite. Um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. This is the newest of these books. It's been out a few years now. I'm not sure what the copyright is. My guess is it's been out four or five years. Chris Voss was the FBI's number one hostage negotiator. He negotiated hundreds of uh, kidnapping releases. Uh, you might say hundreds. Do we have that many kidnappings in the U.S.? No, but the FBI sent him to Haiti 
where they had multiple kidnappings every week. So he was negotiating with hardcore, hey, pay or we're going to kill them. You know, that these were high stakes negotiations. And he did that professionally for a long, long time. But the, the principles he outlines in here are absolutely applicable to business situations. So you'll find this book interesting. It's also physically larger, which means the print is a little bit bigger than some of these smaller ones. And uh, he's got some great stories to tell. So never split the difference. Negotiating as if your life depended on it by Chris Boss. That's my number one recommendation. I'm taking all those books with me on vacation in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be uh, adding a chapter to my one year six figures book on negotiating and uh, will include the concepts I shared with you today. I just penciled those out on my board this morning uh, and then some uh, some of the highlights from these books. OK. I think we're about out of time. Anybody have a last word? Want to jump in? What do we one. bring? Good. What do we bring today for the picnic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we've got uh, burgers and brats and drinks, and I'm um, I'm gonna do a big uh, pot of baked beans. In fact, I'm gonna fry up the bacon here uh, as soon as we're off the call and get those beans started. If you would just bring a side dish or dessert to share, uh, bring them on into the office. We're gonna put them on the big table in here, and then uh, you'll just uh, get your meat outside, then come inside for the fixings. And we got lots of tables and chairs that Hebrews has provided uh, outside. We should have perfect weather day. Um, so come on down and join us from straight up noon. Stephanie, was so, that your question? It was. Okay, great. Kevin? So a couple of things. I put two links in the chat about the, the resources I use for new home construction in the area. I do encourage you all to uh, avail of those two, uh, grab those, bookmark them, and go from there. <clears throat> Number two, um, Reading books with big print is one way to do it. What's even easier, Frank, is the Audible. And and I would encourage yeah. you, each of you, look at those names that he just gave us. Go to the Amazon and and just hit the Audible clip and listen to five minutes. Listen to this book. Some of them are read by the author, and you might like their tonality or not. You might like the way, and if nothing else, you get a five-minute sample. Sometimes they lead with their best pitch. And, yes. and, and you'll get something and you can sample all four of these books that Frank mentioned in very short order. Um, so that's that. The other one, I had a question and I think Frank clarified this for me yesterday. I have a buyer. We just got under contract and, and the clarification was during the option period to schedule inspections and stuff. And Frank was clear that that should be it's not just me going to view the house, even if it's on like show and go to schedule it with the listing agent. Hey, we want to have an inspector there at this or that time. Um, the other question that I was going to ask with that, Frank, is the buyer has actually said, in addition to the inspection, I'd like my plumber repipe guy to give me a quote on changing this old house to PEX plumbing. And yes, I said, you know, that's um. A little bit of a finesse let's talk about that what is the the protocol with regards to that it's not technically a licensed texas inspector this is a contractor giving you an estimate on fixing or redesigning the house what's the yes. what's the word so the the contract states that the buyer has the right to conduct inspections um not even just in the option period you know right up yeah. to the day of closing and that doesn't necessarily mean certified licensed home inspectors. It does mean oh, plumbers, electricians, remodelers, whatever mm -hmm. end use the buyer intends, and they need to gather information to make sure it's going to be a workable deal, they can do that. So it's really an unlimited right to inspect the property. Uh, you just need to schedule through the listing agent. Now, if it is vacant on a show and go, you can say and work it out. Is it okay if we just send some contractors through? Do we need to contact you every time? But make sure that you get their authorization. You just don't want people showing up at the house, even if it's vacant, without having the permission of the listing agent. That will that'll cause a lot of hard feelings. Okay. All right. By the way, on Audible, 
It was Tom Brimer who talked me into getting an Audible subscription last summer. It has changed my life. Um, I, uh, I listen every time I'm in my car now. Uh, I'm a history buff. I'm listening to this massive history of ancient Egypt right now. And then um, I ordered a copy of um, a book written in 1896. I read it in college. I've lost my copy called In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. And when I got out of my truck at the office this morning after listening to that book for 15 minutes, literally there were tears running down my eyes. So powerful, a book written, you know, 130 years ago. But uh, that Audible is is amazing. So yeah, you can learn and you can be inspired, you can be entertained. So I'm, I'm going to put a big exclamation point on Kevin's recommendation there. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me. Stephanie, I'm sorry. I see your hand up. Did you want to get in a last word? I just wanted to let you and um, Kevin know that I just emailed that listing to both of you. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us. I look forward to seeing you in just about uh, two hours for picnic. Uh, God bless. We'll uh, see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. I see you all soon. Uh,